book of Matthew, chapter 5, starting with verse 43. We looked at this briefly last week, but it begs our attention once more time before we get into our lesson this morning. Jesus says, you have heard it, that it hath been said, thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you that ye may be that ye may be that ye may be the children of your father which is in heaven for he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust I want you to know this morning that being children of God, children of God, is just not being called in word children of God. Is that all right? As his offspring, as his adopted sons and daughters, we are to resemble him, we are to be imitators of him, showing not only that we possess the Holy Spirit, but that we're governed by the Holy Spirit. God, in essence, is saying to us as children that the true measure and test of the sincerity and the genuineness of our sonship, being his children, is not in loving our family and our friends and those who are dear to us, but rather in loving our enemies. Because in loving our enemies, that can only accomplish, be accomplished in the nature of God. Is that all right? And it's his command that we be like him and that we be like his son. And that's why he says in that same text in verse 48, be ye therefore perfect even as your father which is in heaven is perfect now understand what perfect mean it means to be complete it means to be mature it means to be finished it means to be pure it means to be holy the idea of this word is speaks to a mechanism it's like a machine that is lacking no parts a machine that has no deficits. Is that all right? Not sinless or without fault, amen, but one like as Job, who was a man who was uh, upright in his character, a man who was regular, who was consistent, who feared God. Is that all right? The Bible says in Job 1.1, there was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man was perfect and upright, and one that feared God and eschewed evil or departed from evil. And I'm asking the question this morning, what has happened, what has ever happened to Christians who, who are not working towards being upright and mature and departing from evil? What's wrong with striving to be like God? And that's why I want to call your attention to Mark, chapter 11, verses 25 and 26. And I know it's chilly and raining outside, but God is still good. Is that all right? And in this context of scripture in Mark, uh, the context is speaking to having faith in God. And Jesus earlier in this text, verses 12 through 14, cursed 
a fig tree because it produced no fruit. And now they're walking, him and Peter are walking by this fig tree and, and Peter in essence says, look, the fig tree dried up and it's withered away. In other words, Peter is saying, listen, you, you just said the word and it withered away. And, and sometimes we think that things in our lives are so difficult that God can't handle it. I'm here to, ha I'm here to tell you that God can handle it with just a word. Amen. With just a word. Is that all right? So the context here is having faith. But Jesus, as the, the master teacher, all right, Jesus, as the master teacher, always finds a teachable moment. Y'all ever realize that? That Jesus took advantage of every opportunity to teach his disciples a spiritual lesson. Is that all right? So they're, they're coming and Jesus says to him in verse 22, after he said he was surprised that the fig tree had withered away. And sometimes we pray for things and God answers our prayer and we're shocked that he answered our prayer. My question to you is, why did you act in the first place if you didn't believe he could do it? Is that all right? So he says in verse number 22, have faith in God. For truly or verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. So in other words, you have to have confidence, you have to be faithful, you have to have faith and not doubt and not waver. And ask in accordance to God's will, and God is able. And some of us believe that God is able, but we don't believe that he will. Well, I'm here to tell you that he's able and he will. But you have to be willing to have the faith. Is that all right? Verse 24, therefore I say unto you, what, so, what, what things soever you desire, when you pray, believe that you will receive them and you shall have them. But watch the teachable moment. Jesus is awesome. All right? Now, we, we, we want the confidence in whatever we ask God to answer, don't we? Amen about it. I'll say amen for you. Wake up this morning. Amen about it. I know it was a long, late, long, late last night for some of us. But God is good. He says, and when you stand praying, is that what your Bible says? And when you stand praying, you see, we have new and Old Testament example of prayer and the posture of prayer, either kneeling in most cases, standing in some cases. But the most important posture in prayer is not whether we stand, sit, or kneel. But rather, the most important posture in prayer is the posture of our heart. Are you getting this? So understand then that it, it is our posture when we come to God in prayer that affects the acceptableness of our prayers to God. So he says when you, when you stand praying, your posture, when you stand praying, what's your posture? Your posture should be forgive. The posture of your heart when you pray, forgive. Is that all right? If you have ought, hold a grudge, hold anything against any, that your Father also which is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. So the posture that is important is forgive. Is that all right? 
In other words, Jesus is teaching us that in order that we might have great confidence and expectation of those things which we ask God in prayer, or in other words, for our, our prayers uh, to prevail with God, a necessary requirement and qualification is that we first have the posture to forgive any who have in any way been injurious to us. In other words, you and I can't come to God with a haughty posture. As if we're all that and then some. Is that all right? But understand what this forgive means. This word forgives, forgive in the original language means to release, to leave alone, to let go without demanding. Let go. Let go. We say it all the time. Let go and let God, right? You see, God is saying when you come to me, you have to have the posture to be able to forgive and let some things go yourself. Is that all right? But understand this. It is God alone that truly forgives. All right? Now, let's, let's make this point. God alone truly forgives. Go with me to Isaiah chapter 43 in the verse number 25. Real quick. We're going to try to get through here, all right? Isaiah chapter 43 in the verse number 25. When you have it, say amen. The word of God says, I, even I, some translation says, I, yes, I alone, am he that blotted out thy transgressions for mine own sake and will not remember thy sins. Is that what your Bible says? He says, I and I alone. Is that all right? So when it comes to forgiving sins, God is alone is the only one who can truly pardon or forgive sins. Jump with me to the next chapter, Isaiah 44, in the verse 22. The word of God says, I have, I have, I alone have blotted out as a thick cloud thy transgressions and as a cloud thy sins. Return unto me, for I have redeemed thee. You see, he's the only one that can forgive sins because he's the only one who redeems. Is that all right? Are we getting this? You say, well, why are you making this point? Because there are some of our denominational friends who teach a, a doctrine called absolution. And what absolution teaches is that man can pardon or remit sins. That's why some of our denominational friends can go into confessional booths and some man on the other side of the booth can pardon their sin because they teach a thing called absolution. But the thing they don't understand is, is that God is the only one who can truly forgive sins. Are y'all understanding what I'm saying? You say, well, where do they get that doctrine from? They get the doctrine from the Bible. They twist scriptures like they do the other scriptures. John chapter 20. In verse 23, here's where they get it from. John chapter 20, and I'm trying to hasten. I don't want to go too fast, but I, I need to get through here, all right? Y'all bear with me. John chapter 20, in the verse 23, here's where they get it from. Jesus speaking to his apostles says, Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them. And whose sins ye retain, they are retained. But when you exegete this scripture along with the text and go through the context, you understand that Jesus is not giving the apostles the power or the authority to forgive sins or to retain sins. What he's telling them is when the Holy Spirit comes, he's going to teach you, he's going to inspire you to declare God's will on the matter of forgiving sins. That's it. Are we getting that? 
In other words, they will be the ones pronouncing on what terms God will extend forgiveness. Because all forgiveness lays at the feet of God. Is that all right? The only man, man, that ever forgave sins was the man, Christ Jesus. Is that all right? Mark chapter 2 and verse 10, Jesus said, But that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. He told the crippled man to rise up and walk. So the only man that ever had the authority from the Father to forgive sins on earth was Jesus the Christ. Are we all right with that? So the question is, in what sense then does God command and require that we forgive one another? What sense is he speaking to? Well, the point is this. Our forgiveness, letting go, has more to do with cultivating the attitude of Christ than a specific act. Okay? Remember, it's all about us becoming more like him. Are y'all getting me? Remember Philippians 2.5 says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Is that all right? Then Ephesians chapter 4 and the verse 13 says, Till we all come into the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Verse 15 says, But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. In other words, Christ is saying in Ephesians 4, I gave gifts to the church, my body, the church of Christ, so everybody in the church, all of you, can grow up to be like me. And sometimes we have the nerve to still try to be like ourselves in God's house and think that that's going to please God and it's not going to please God. We have to change our thinking. Are we getting this? So how did Jesus, the man, respond when he was injured by other people? Look with me in Luke chapter 23. Remember, it's all about our posture. All right? It's all about our attitude when it comes to what sense God wants us to forgive one another, all right? We're to grow and to cultivate our faith, cultivate our minds to be more like Christ. So let's look and see what kind of mind did Christ have when it came to being injured by other people. Is that all right? Luke chapter 23 and the verse number 34. If you have it, say amen. amen. Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them. Are you looking at your Bible? Father, Forgive them. You, you beat within an inch of your life. You're on a cross and you're actually paying a penalty for the ones who put you on the cross. And you say, Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. This was the mind of our Lord and our Savior. Is that all right? And even a man named Stephen 
In the book of Acts, chapter 7 and the verse 60, even while being stoned to death, Stephen said, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. Now, how was you able to say that, Stephen? How were you able to be, be stoned and still say in your last words, your last breath, Father, lay it not to their charge. Lord, lay it not to this sin to their charge. How are you able to say that, Stephen? Well, the Bible says in Acts chapter 6, in the verse number 5, that Stephen was a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost. So it wasn't the carnal man who said that because we all know what the carnal man would say. But when you're full of faith and full of the Holy Spirit and you're governed by the Spirit of God, amen, you can do God's will. It's possible. With men, it's impossible, but with God, all things are possible. Some of us, even as children of God, make our mind up already and say, you know what? You know, if somebody did that to me, I, I, I'm just telling you, I couldn't do it. I ain't going to do it. No, it's not that you couldn't do it. It's that you won't do it. You got to get your want to fix. Is that all right? Now, let me, let me just drop this down now. We're almost finished. Let me just drop this down because sometimes we think that letting go frees the person of their responsibility to get it right with God. That's not the case. That's not the case at all. And I need you to listen closely now. All right? Understand that our forgiveness of an individual does not absolve them from their responsibility to repent. Are y'all getting this? It doesn't absolve them from their, from their responsibility to repent. In other words, when, I'm, when God is saying, listen, Mark, when you pray, I need you to let some things go. If you expect to receive some things of me, you're going to have to have a heart and a posture to let some things go in your mind. Is that all right? You're not excusing what the person did, but you can't do no harm to them. Don't go evil for evil. Don't go tit for tat. Is that all right? Are we getting this? You say, well, why do, I, why, do, why do you say it doesn't absolve them from their responsibility to repent? Because Jesus said in Luke 17, in verse number 3, Luke 17, in verse number 3, Jesus said, take heed to yourselves. If your brother sins against you, rebuke him. That's what he said. Rebuke him. And if, if, if he repents, forgive him. That's what the Bible says. You say, well, this sounds like a contradiction. Why would he say on one end when you pray, forgive him, and then he says on this one, if he repents, then forgive him. There are two different things. It's twofold here, and you have to understand this, all right? In other words, our posture to God is one way, and our posture to one another is another way. In other words, you can do me wrong, and I can still be cordial with you. Amen. I can still smile and talk to you. Amen about it. But I don't have the right, I don't have permission from God to tell you I forgive you and what you did was okay. I don't have the ability to do that. God didn't give me permission to do that. You still got to get it right with God. Are we getting this? You see, we can't harbor any ill will and then go to God in prayer and think it's going to be heard. Is that all right? Yet and still we're, again, not permitted to dismiss a person's evil. Go and tell them it's okay. Thus freeing them from their obligation to repent and get it right with God. Is that all right? Are y'all understanding what I'm saying? In other words... Sometimes you have people, sometimes, if I smack you kind in the face and curse them out, amen, and then I show up tomorrow, hey, brother, you kind, how you doing? God bless you. Love you, brother. Like nothing happened. Sometimes we do that. Sometimes we hurt each other. We, we do something to each other. Then we act the next day like nothing ever happened. 
And he would be wrong to tell me, hey, brother, I forgive you, man. Everything is okay. No, you would be wrong in doing that because God, God didn't give you permission to say that. You don't treat me wrong. You don't do harm to me. Amen. But you can't release me from something that God didn't release me from. Are we getting this? You see, it's still about our attitude and posture and our disposition with God. All right? Now watch this. Just as we discussed and examined a few weeks ago about our worship and praise. Y'all remember that lip service? There's also a difference between lip forgiveness and heart forgiveness. Are y'all understanding this? Go with me to the book of Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18. Starting with verse number 21. Matthew chapter 18. Starting with verse number 21. This is all about our posture towards God. Is that all right? You see, a lot of the times we think it's between me and you, and it's not about me and you. It's about your posture with God. Because ultimately, that's who we all have to answer to. Amen about it. Matthew chapter 18, starting with verse 21. If you have it, say amen. Word of God says, then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me? And I forgive him till seven times. Jesus said unto him, I say not unto thee unto seven times, but unto 70 times seven. You see, we think we're doing something. Amen. When we do our little part. And Jesus has to remind us, no, that's nothing. You got to do more than that. Is that all right? And you can do more than that if you trust and depend on me and not yourself. Is that all right? Verse number 23. Therefore, is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king which would take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him which owed him 10,000 talents but for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold and his wife and children and all that he had in payment to be made. The servant therefore fell down and worshiped him saying, Lord, have patience with me and I will pay thee all. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. But the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him a hundred pence. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me that thou owest. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and but Sodom begged him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. And he would not. But went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. Now, y'all know that's wrong because you can't pay nobody in prison. Is that all right? So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very, very sorry came and told unto their Lord all that was done. Then his Lord, after that he had called him, said unto him, O oh, thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt because thou desirest me. Shouldest not thou also have had compassion 
on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee. And his Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise shall my heavenly father do also unto you if ye from your hearts, from your hearts, from your hearts, forgive not everyone his brother their trespasses. Hold a grudge if you want to. Be impatient if you want to. The Bible says, James 2.13, there will be no mercy for those who have not shown mercy to others. But if you have been merciful, God will be merciful when he judges you. Ephesians 4.32 says, be kind and compassionate to one another. Forgiving each other just as in Christ, God forgave you. Colossians 3.13 says, make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. I pray you come back this evening at four because we'll be considering this evening at four o'clock the high cost of getting even. How an unforgiving spirit can be a matter of life and death, both physically and spiritually. In the close, I want to go to Isaiah chapter 64. You say you're almost done? Amen. Isaiah 64 and a verse number six. As we consider, let go and let God. And I, on purpose, didn't intend to preach a lot today. I just want us to hear what God's word says and let it sink in. Is that all right? Let's meditate on what God is saying to each of us. Because at the end of the day, hell is too hot. And eternity is too long for us to hold on to any foolish grudge. Is that all right? So whatever you need to do, whatever I need to do, to make it right with God, and we'll be considering that at 4 p.m., the things we need to do to make things right, because sometimes you'll do all that you can to make it right, and guess what? There needs to be two cooperating parties. But the thing is, we have to make sure that you've done all that you can do in the sight of God, because you will give an account. You will give an answer. Every knee shall bow. Every tongue will confess. Every idle word that you speak, you will give an account for. Every idle word. What does that mean? Every word that you speak that doesn't build the person up. You say, I've been thinking in my thoughts. God, know what you're thinking. Get your mind right. 
We're children of the Most High God. We need to grow up. We treat this like it's romper room. Like this is pre-K. And we got a soul at stake. God is not the one to play with. Isaiah 64, 6. And this is just to close, just in case, just in case, just in case, just in case. Just in case. I ain't going to say anything. Because sometimes we'll always put it on the other person. It's always someone else's fault. Someone else is always to blame. I'm always in the right and they're always in the wrong. So just in case the enemy is trying to influence us, understand that the Bible says, but we are all. Do we need to define all? as an unclean thing and all our righteousness are as filthy rags and we all do fade as a leaf and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. The Bible says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. On your best day, on my best day, we still need God's forgiveness and his mercy. So how dare us talk about any of us because we all need the mercy of God. Let go and let God. I hope you come back at four. There's some things God's going to say to us some more. Amen. You say you're going to watch the Browns. Uh Lord, have mercy. I'm praying for you. Yes. Ah, uh, y'all, I almost brought my terrible towel, uh, but I said I wasn't going to do that. But let us, let us consider the message. Let us really contemplate what God is saying to each of us. Don't look to your left. Don't look to your right. You have a soul to save. Is that all right? If you're here today and you've not obeyed the gospel of Christ, then you definitely need God's forgiveness. Walking another day without Christ Jesus as your advocate, amen, can be eternally detrimental. You can come today having heard the word of God. Do you believe it? Without faith is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a reward of them that diligently seek him. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Is that all right? We don't come here with faith. God gives us faith. Is that all right? We have to repent. We have to turn. Amen. We have to turn from the world to God. We have to make up our minds that we're not no longer willing or want to follow the ways of the world. We don't want to be continually conformed to the world, but we want to be transformed. And only God can help us with that. We have to confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Is that all right? And God raised him on the third day for us, for our sins. And then to complete the act in obedience 
be buried in baptism for, 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 for the remission of your sins, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You can do that today. Are you willing? For those of us who need to let go and let God, let's ask God to help us. Because Jesus reminded us, without me, you can do nothing. Let us